Sup you beautiful people. Hope you've had a fantastic day. Welcome back to another new episode of What If Naruto Was In The Marvel Universe. If you guys enjoyed this what if, comment down below and let me know. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel after watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. Before we get into it though, check out Bill Billy Comics. Bill Billy Comics is the official trusted place to read hit exclusive series from top creators. Bill Billy Comics is a great online webtoons and web comics reader among all reading apps. Enjoy the best new comics, manhwa, and exclusive webtoons on Bill Billy Comics. Download the app now and jump right into it. The link is in the description. Now let's start this video. Tuskelion, Washington DC. January 29, 2007, 1230. Have you found them? Fury asked while pacing and drubbing his forehead. In front of Fury is Coulson, who is managing a team of techs that should be monitoring how and where Romanov is. But of course, nothing went to plan, the same with every situation Naruto is involved in. The first incident is how they suddenly disappeared in Clint's homestead. Only Coulson was present at that time. But when Romanov's emergency band hasn't shown up anywhere in the world, that's when Fury decided to bring in a whole team of techs. Good thing Coulson received a message from Romanov saying that the band short-circuited during transport. Coulson was able to pinpoint her general location, which is Rome, but anything more exact is impossible. The full location shows that it's jumping everywhere in Rome every 5 seconds with no pattern. Fury would have admired the Naruto's ingenuity in counter-spy techniques, but it's aimed as shield, and it's working. Yes sir. They're somewhere in Durban, South Africa. Coulson answered. Durban? What the hell are they doing in Durban? Fury asked. His mind is scanning very intelligence reports he read that came from the general direction. A few seconds of furious thinking, he hit upon an idea that is a bit out there, but knowing a bit about Naruto, it is certainly in the realm of possibility. Coulson. Search the intelligence reports on Ulysses Claw. Coulson nodded and immediately typed in Ulysses Claw. When his profile came up, he projected it towards the big screen. Ulysses Claw. Age 40. Well-connected black market weapons seller. Top 3 on the Interpol list. Mainly operates in a salvage yard near Durban. Are they going to take him down? Coulson mused. I'm not sure if I should support or not support this. The political blowout if this ever connected with S.H.I.E.L.D. would be such a massive pain in the ass to sort out, but removing a piece of shit from the surface of the earth is such a great payoff. Fury mused to himself, but everyone in the room certainly heard it. Good thing they have enough self-preservation instinct not to call out their boss. Coulson. Send a satellite readjustment and orbit lock request to Saturkin. I want eyes on that place as soon as possible. Coulson and his crew immediately blasted the satellite reconnaissance team with Fury's request. They must have been running around with shit in their pants because five minutes later, they have surveillance satellite orbit locked over Durban. Give me eyes, people. Come on. Coulson ordered, making everyone but Coulson move faster. Eyes up. Coulson announced at the same time a live feed from the satellite showed up on the screen. Coulson scanned the area, focusing mainly on each ship. Fury is also observing each ship with his discerning eye, until the view panned on top of a boat weirdly covered in splashes of red. Tighten on that ship. Fury ordered. Coulson immediately saw what Fury saw and tightened on top of it. It's basically a massacre, similar to Budapest. A lot of the techs that can't handle the gory image run out of the room, presumably to puke in the bathroom. I guess we found them. Coulson mumbled. The techs returned in waves, looking a whole lot better. They watched the ship with no developments. They were about to throw in the towel since they thought that the group already left until the hull of the vessel suddenly ripped open. There's nothing there. It looks like it just opened. Can Naruto turn invisible? Coulson observed. No. I think that's a plane with active camouflage, just like the Quinjets. What I wouldn't do to have the god's eyes right now. Fury waiting. After another few minutes, blue light seemed to pulse from inside the ship. They have no idea what they should expect next, but a spiraling dome of blue energy grinding everything inside it to dust, is the last thing they thought they would ever see. After the dome faded, only a large crater was left behind and a whole lot of dust. Coulson looked back towards Fury and asked in a joking tone. You still want to bring him in again, boss. After a small chuckle on Fury's disgruntled look, he checked on a hunch of his and looks like he's right. A few seconds the invisible plane appeared or not appeared, Romanov's phone went entirely offline. Looks like Romanov got in on the plane and went wherever the hell they're going next. Fury took on one of his serious thinking faces. Coulson recognizes this one is something that appears every time he would make a big decision, just like he saw before with Danvers. Clean everything up, no evidence of what we were doing. No logs, no time and stamps, no emails. If I find out details about this op got out of this room, I'll send every one of you personally to a gulag in Siberia. Got it. Fury threatened everyone with a hard stare down. Everyone nodded frantically, sure that their boss would go through with his threat. Good. Coulson, come with me. He ordered and walked out of the room without missing a beat. 
Coulson quickly got out of his chair and followed Fury. The pair marched through the Tuskelion. Coulson is expecting them to head straight to Fury's office, but when they reach the elevator, Fury pushed the button towards the helipad's way up top. When they reached the helipad, Fury told the standby pilot that Coulson would fly the thing himself. Coulson walked straight to the pilot's seat, and Fury sat on the co-pilot's seat. Though dark and head to Huntsville, Alabama. We need to pick something up. Fury said in a clipped tone. Coulson didn't even question Fury and flipped some buttons. After checking everything is okay, he flew the Quinjet towards Alabama. Not like I'm questioning you boss, but what are we going to do in Alabama? Coulson hesitantly asked. I'm going to pick up a file I made in 1995, Fury said. Coulson tried to think back about what happened in 1995, and the only thing that important happened is the Carol Danvers situation. The question is, what file could be so crucial that Fury had to hide it off the shield system? I know what you're thinking, but it's not sensitive. It's just a pet project that we need to start up. Phase 2 would not be enough if we would have to fight someone as powerful as Naruto. He continued. Coulson is, of course, aware about the study of the Tesseract and its future use as a weapon, but what could be more effective than weapons powered by it? It's time to start the Avengers Initiative. Jersey City, New Jersey. January 29, 2007, 1400 hours. Donathan Pangborn is living a good life. It has been almost two years since he left Cambridge, and he can confidently say that he did well for himself. He runs a booming auto shop, a girlfriend that quickly turned into a fiancé, and finally, he was able to reconnect with his family. But even after all that, there's one thing he never forgot to do, to accomplish the Ancient One's mission personally given to him. To find the Yellow Fox. He has always been looking for any news or signs of the fox. Most of the things he found are of inconsequential or hoax, that's why he and his fiancée, Joanna, have not married yet. He told her that the moment he finds the sign of the fox they would marry, which she accepted readily. It's like she knows that John is still on a mission. The sign is like a self-imposed hurdle for him to accomplish before he lives happily ever after. Joanna only knows his cover story, but he explicitly told her that there is more to everything he told her, and the only time he could share everything is when they are married. They almost broke up when he said that. Currently, he's working on a heavily damaged 1970 Dodge Charger of a cop friend of his from New York. What did you do with this beauty? Jonathan exclaimed while under the hood, checking each small part. Javier Esposito can't help but look ashamed by what he had happened, although it had been done for the line of duty. He watched the news about the machete killer car chase that went from New York all the way to I-95. Javier asked hesitantly. The guy who managed to nab a Linko Bearcat the fuck are you thinking when you took on a glorified tank with a charger? Jonathan couldn't help but shout. The absurdness of the situation is just too much for him. Hey. We stopped him. Well, Castle stopped him, but that doesn't matter. We got our guy. Javier weakly defended. How did you find him anyway? I heard he leaves nothing behind for you to get let on. Jonathan offhandedly asked. Hey. We found a lead, or at least our captain did, indirectly. Javier answered. Why the hell would your captain find some leads? Because the Nine Tails bargained with him. This got the attention of Jonathan. He doesn't know why, but something in the back of his mind is screaming at him. He rolled out from under the car and stared at Javier. Who's the Nine Tails? Jonathan asked seriously. Some kind of information broker that only deals with military and law enforcement worldwide. Barter's weird stuff for information. The only catch was that he contacts you by leaving a package. Everybody tried to find him, but he's just too good. In the end, everybody agreed that they'll use the info, but wouldn't let it get out to the general public. So, just don't tell anyone too much. Javier explained in as much detail as he can get away with. Why, Nine Tails? I don't know, but Castle said that the Nine Tails could come from Japanese mythology. Some kind of immortal fox demon or something. Javier answered with a shrug. Jonathan quickly stood up and grabbed Javier at his shoulders. With almost a desperate plea, he asked. When did he first show up? Bro? What the hell? Just answer the damn question. Alright. The first reported package was received almost two years ago. Now get off me, bro. Javier finally answered and forced his way out of Jonathan's grasp. Jonathan, for his part, is now scanning his mind for everything that he read inside the libraries. One book mentions that the Nine Tails Fox is one of the strongest yakai or god, but usually only uses their power for mischievousness or pranks. One of their skills are shape-shifting and invisibility. That skill set could explain how it can move around undetected and gather information for selling. If a Nine Tail Fox demon decided to change the flow of time for its pleasure, that could explain why the Ancient One would see a shift in the future. Javier. I need you to get out of here. I'll fix up your car, don't worry. I just need you to go away. Jonathan said forcefully while pushing Javier out of the door. Bro? What the fuck, man? Come on. You're acting weird. Javier shouted. Go, man. I'll call you about the car later. Goodbye. Jonathan said before slamming the door in front of Javier's face. 
Jonathan could hear him shouting obscenities from the other side, but he has to do something long overdue. Jonathan went ran up the second floor of his garage and went into his office. He closed the blinds and locked the door. When everything is locked tight, he sat down in the middle of the room and meditated. It has been a while, but he was still able to create an astral projection. The projection traveled far until it finally reached its destination. The Ancient One is in the middle of the room meditating when she felt a projection rapidly approaching her. She opened her eyes and saw something that she's waiting for a long time. Master Pangborn. Good to see you again. The Ancient One greeted Pangborn, who bowed in respect. I think I found a clue about the fox. Jonathan reported. The Ancient One just gestured him to go on. There seems to be an information broker that is helping the military and law enforcement. No one saw or heard him. He only leaves behind packages with information and a price. Pangborn repeated Javier's explanation. The only thing that identifies it as him is a name he leaves behind, Nine Tails. The Ancient One looks contemplative for a moment, thinking how a nine-tailed fox demon got so strong that even the Time Stone can't see its past or future. It took her a few minutes to think about the implications of a powerful demon loose in the world. Master Pangborn. It looks like you have succeeded in your mission. I hope you have a good and enjoyable life. May we see each other again. The Ancient One said with a smile. Thank you for everything, Master. You all are invited to my wedding, whenever and wherever it might be. Jonathan expressed his gratitude with a bow before disappearing. The Ancient One stood up and walked out of the room. She walked towards the training ground. When she reached the viewing platform of the fields, she shouted her order. Master Mordo. Assemble a team. You're going to look for a nine-tailed fox. Mordo, his mid-step on the air, immediately dropped to the ground. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. January 29, 2007, 1600 hours. Where the hell are they? Clint is anxiously waiting at his porch. 30 minutes ago, he and Laura determined that the baby didn't turn around inside her womb. The baby is breached, causing the labor to be more dangerous for her and the baby. They only noticed it when Laura's contractions continued to strengthen, but the baby can't seem to be pushed out. Running out of time and out of options, he tried to call Natasha. Unlike Clint, who only has basic first aid understanding, Natasha has an extensive repertoire of medical knowledge that can help him, and Naruto's teleportation ability can bring her anywhere instantly. But Natasha's phone was somehow out of range, which is bullshit since it has a global network connection. The reason he was outside right now was because Laura heard what Naruto said to Natasha. The knives are special. Just throw it anywhere, and I'll know when you're in trouble. Clint is still skeptical about it, but with no other choice, he searched for the box of knives Naruto gave Natasha. He ran out of the door and threw it on the ground. That was five minutes ago and he was slowly losing it. Laura is still upstairs trying hold on for Natasha, but the baby would get out one way or another, with or without complication. Clint was just about to run up the stairs when he heard a particularly agonized cry of Laura, when he suddenly saw Naruto and Natasha appear on top of the knife. He was about to go on a tirade about where the hell are they and all that, but Natasha cut him off. Before you say anything, we have a lot to do. She said while walking inside followed by Naruto. Clint has enough presence of mind to shut up and follow her lead. Get a got tub of water and lots of towels. After that, go be with Lila. She needs you right now. Naruto and I would handle it. Clint was going to complain about Naruto, but Natasha just cut him off again. Just go get the stuff. Clint just nodded and ran off to get what Natasha requested. And you can't go in the room unless I call for you. Natasha shouted as a final order. She looked behind her and saw Naruto staring at her. That was so hot. Naruto involuntarily let out. Natasha would have feel flattered, but time is of the essence. Focus, Naruto. Follow me. Laura should be upstairs. Natasha said while running up the stairs, sure that Naruto was following her. When they got into the room, Natasha went to Laura's side. You're going to be okay. We got you. She said. Hey Nat. What took you so long? Laura said jokingly in a weak voice. Naruto had to pick something up that would help you, but the catch is, you can't see or hear what's happening. Natasha answered seriously. Why? Laura asked in pain because the contraction is hitting her again. Because you can't know what we would use or do. Natasha answered before Clint walks into the room to drop off the items. He walked towards Laura's side and whispered to her ear. Nat would take care of you. I guess Naruto would too. I'll be with Lila. I love you. Stay strong, hun. He then walked out of the room and gave a slightly grateful nod towards Naruto. Naruto closed and locked the door when Clint is out of the room. Naruto then retrieved something from his pocket and gave it to Natasha. Natasha looked at it and saw as a pair of earplugs and a blindfold. We'll take care of you and your baby. Natasha said with a smile before placing the earplugs in the blindfold. Naruto then did a series of hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground. Chains of black writing spread out of the room. Crawling the floor, walls, and ceiling before disappearing. This caused Natasha to stumble backward, shocked by the development. He did another hand sign which caused his hand to glow white, and he placed it on Laura's abdomen. 
press the bead with the cross and place it on Laura's chest. It will create a 3D internal scan of her. You could see what's happening inside. The writings make sure that everything in the room is sanitary. I'm going to keep boosting her and the baby's vitality. It would give you another 20 or 30 minutes. Naruto explained, which cleared up a lot of things for Natasha. She's going to file her questions about it for later. Natasha nodded and followed Naruto's instruction when it was all said and done. She finally understood why Naruto was insistent on getting the beads. It is basically the perfect medical device. Clint is in Lila's room, playing with her, trying to get his mind off her wife's pregnancy. It was 30 minutes later when he heard something new. A baby's cry. He was going to run towards the room when he remembered Natasha's order to stay out of the room until called. It was another 5 minutes before Naruto knocked on the door of Lila's room. When Clint faced him, he also saw Natasha with him. Everything went fine. Laura and the baby are both healthy. Natasha said with a bright smile. Naruto was also beaming behind her. Go on in. We'll play with Lila for a bit. Clint rapidly stood up and hugged Natasha. Thanks Nat. Thank you a lot. He whispered. When he disengaged Natasha, he gave Naruto a pat of gratitude on his shoulder. He ran immediately ran towards the master bedroom and saw one of the most beautiful things he ever saw. Laura was carrying their baby, his wrapped with towels. Hey hun. Clint quietly said. He walked over to Laura's side and hugged her. Want to hold him? Laura asked. Clint nodded and carefully took their baby. Hi Cooper. I'm your dad. I'll make sure you are always safe. He introduced himself. Clint and Laura couldn't help but shed a tear at the moment. In Inzana, Wakanda. January 29, 2007, 2200 hours. Chaka took quite a while to tell the story about his brother, Zuri's role, and the radicalized view his brother took on. By the end of it all, most of the discrepancies that happened in 1992 were answered. Nkathu and Chala are the most affected by the revelations. Nkathu, because he's the current leader of the border tribe, which were the most affected by the incident. The previous elder died during Claw's destruction. Chala, for his part, was shocked that his father had killed his brother or left a member of the royal family to fend for himself. Baba. Are you saying that there's a prince out there that we know nothing about and didn't bring him home? Chala quietly asked, his rage only being held back by his training. Yes. I entertained the idea of bringing him here, but this is not his home. He has no love for Wakanta, or its people. I cannot say for sure that he would stay the same, but I can't take the chance. Chaka defended himself. Kathu suddenly stood up and bowed. I would like to retire for the night, your highness. He requested, hoping to get out of the council before he could say something that might jeopardize the border tribe's position. I think it's for the best if we all retire for the night. It has been a trying day for all of us. Sarati suggested. Chaka looked around the room and saw the exhausted expression on everyone. Nothing more could be achieved tonight. Yes. You're right, Elder Sarati. Chaka said with a sigh. I, at this moment, end this tribal council meeting. He announced. Everyone gave a small bow before leaving quickly. Chaka is sure that by tomorrow night, most of Wakanda would have heard the story. Nkathu alone would surely announce it tonight. The only ones left in the room are Chala, Chaka, Okoye, and the rest of the Dora Milahe. Baba. Let me try to find Njobu's son. Chala requested. No. Accepting a new member of the Golden Tribe right now would jeopardize the stability of Wakanda. Chaka forcefully said. Chala was taken aback by his father's tone. We can't just leave him out there. We are his family. We have an obligation to help him. Chala reasoned. And I am the king. I have an obligation to Wakanda above all. Chaka roared. You would not try to find him. He ordered with a glare. The king stood up and walked out of the door, his door and Malahe following him. Before he could leave the room altogether, he said, we would speak about this no further. When the door closed, only a seething Chala and a stoic Okoi were left. I might have been ordered not to do anything, but he didn't say someone else couldn't find him. Chala said to no one in particular, but Okoi heard him. You realize that I still serve the king. Okoi deadpanned. Yeah. I know. That's why I'm going to stay put and do nothing. Chala said with a grin. You're going to ask him, aren't you? Okoi asked, already knowing the answer. Of course, Okoi. It's the fastest way to do it. Chala answered with a shrug. The pair started to walk out of the room. What do you think he would ask for this time? Okoi asked, genuinely curious. I don't know. You know him. It's either absurdly cheap or absurdly expensive. He said while closing the meeting room door. Clint's home said Missouri. January 29, 2007, 1700 hours. Clint left the master bedroom, leaving Laura and Cooper to rest up. Bringing a new life into the world sure must be exhausting. He went towards Lila's room to check on his guests. As Clint was nearing his daughter's room, he heard three voices laughing. It looks like everything's okay at their end. He knocked on the door and opened it. What he saw utterly floored him. Natasha, Naruto, and Lila were playing with some kind of robot pony. If he just focuses on that, everything might be okay. 
But behind him, there's a massive mound of toys and dresses that certainly didn't come from his daughter's cabinet, and he was reasonably sure who's to blame for the mess. The trio didn't stop playing after he went in, so he cleared his throat, trying to get everyone's attention. Lila and Naruto looked at him with an eerily similar expression. This just served to annoy Clint even more. How the hell can a 20-something man look like his angelic daughter? Natasha, on the other hand, was thoroughly enjoying the play-by-play. -play. She couldn't help herself and placed her face on her palms to stifle her laughter. Hi daddy. Look at what Rudo gave me. Lila said with a smile while showing her father the robot pony. Clint wasn't even sure that kind of toy is commercially available. That's great, honey. Clint forced out with his eyebrow twitching uncontrollably. Would you mind if I borrow Aunt Natasha and Naruto for a moment? Um? There's no need for that Chiki, I mean Clint. Naruto said while continuously looking around the room, probably trying to find a way out. Clint's eye twitch is now more pronounced. His strange smile just made it more hilarious, although Naruto just ignored him. Naruto faced Lila and hugged her. I have so much fun playing with you. I'll visit you soon. He said with a smile. Naruto then turned towards Natasha and her quick kiss. I'll pick you up in two days. Just keep a knife on you. He finished his statement with a wink. Sure. Always have it on me. Natasha answered while patting the small of her back. Sorry, we weren't able to do the last part of the date. Are you kidding me? This is way better, although less delicious. Naruto asserted. He saw Natasha's confused expression, so he continued. My plan was for us to go to Japan and eat some ramen. I should have expected that. Natasha said with a smile. Clint was guarding the door while Naruto obviously said his goodbyes, preparing himself to give Naruto a beatdown. Hey Clint. I gotta bounce. Naruto said with a cheerful smile. You should try and use that bow of yours. You're going to love it. Bye. Naruto announced before suddenly disappearing. Clint just stood there, dumbfounded. He could faintly hear Lila talking about how Naruto is some kind of magician or something, but he's still processing how he could forget that the guy could teleport. Only Natasha's gentle slap to his arm snapped him out of his stupor. You hear that Clint? Naruto is a magician. Obviously, guarding the door won't work on a magician. Natasha teased. Clint ignored Natasha and took a deep calming breath. Lila. Want to have an early dinner and see how mom's doing later. He said while crouching down to her daughter's eye level. Lila's eyes sparkled, and she nodded repeatedly. Can I bring my new toy? Lila asked with those big puppy eyes. Of course, honey. Clint forced out after a pause. You can watch some TV downstairs while your aunt and I prepare dinner. Kids really are full of energy because Lila still has enough energy to run downstairs, even though she's been awake for 9 hours. Clint and Nat walked out of the room and towards the kitchen. So? Clint drawled out when the pair reached the kitchen. Where'd you guys go? Wow. You lasted until we reached the kitchen. Good for you. Natasha said sarcastically. Clint just tuned out the sarcasm and just waited for her to continue. We had breakfast in Rome. Some friend of his owned a restaurant there. He took you to Rome. Clint asked in disbelief, which Natasha just nodded to. Of course, he took you to Rome. How the hell did he even know someone in Rome? Natasha started taking out ingredients from the cupboards and fridge, while Clint prepares the pots and oven. Natasha had stayed with the Barton so much that she knows everything in the kitchen. I don't know, but I think he's one of his customers. I thought every one of his customers is military and law enforcement. Apparently not. I met another one of his customers, but I can't talk about it. Why can't you talk about it? Come on. You can tell me anything. Clint. No matter what you say. I can't tell you unless Naruto is nearby to deal with the aftermath. What the hell? Were you strapped to a bomb or something? Clint said in jest, but Natasha's lack of denial caused him to look away from what he's doing. Tell me you're not strapped to a bomb. I'm not wearing a bomb. Natasha answered in a flat tone. Holy shit. You're strapped to a bomb. We need to call Coulson. Clint exclaimed while walking out of the kitchen. Don't Clint. It's fine. As long as I don't let anyone know about stuff, the benefits outweigh the potential danger. The danger drops to zero if Naruto's nearby. Natasha reasoned. What happened on your date that you're 100% sure that he can stop the bomb? Clint questioned after he calmed himself. I'll tell you someday, but I'm more than sure you'll see it. Natasha responded. Clint wanted to push for an answer, but he decided not to push it. So, what can you tell me? Clint bargained. I can tell you about the breakfast part if you're not going to tell anyone on S.H.I.E.L.D. Natasha's answer certainly got Clint's attention, but he needs to know how bad it is before promising anything. From the scale of stealing snacks to hiding a nuke, how bad is it? Knowing a dead hitman is still alive and running a restaurant. Natasha explained. Eh? That's a low one. Clint said after thinking about it for a second. Hit me. Okay. Leon, the professional of New York, is in Rome. Damn. What did you know? The legend's still alive. I know right. Imagine him being your server, and your date is apparently a friend of his. Natasha said while setting up the table. 
Clint washed his hand and walked out of the room. I'll see what Naruto did to my boat while there's still some light left. It'll only take a minute. Clint informed Natasha. I'll get Lila, and we'll wait for you outside. I want to see what Naruto did to it. Natasha replied. Clint nodded and went up the house and retrieved the still pink bow from the cabinet. He decided that it's best to clean off the pink paint so that it can look more presentable. He entered the bathroom and retrieved the shower head and set the thermostat to high. The moment the hot water hit the paint, it started melting off. When all the paint was off, he noticed the minuscule engraved characters on his bow. It reminded him of the carved characters on the trees in New York. Naruto must have done something to it. Clint walked down the stairs, making sure to retrieve a quiver full of arrows, and walked out of the door. He saw Natasha and Lily sitting down on the porch. What took you so long? Natasha asked. It was still pink, so I washed it. Good thing it immediately came off. Clint answered while retrieving the bow. He showed it to Natasha and asked, you know what these engravings are. All I know is that Naruto uses them to do almost everything. Natasha answered after examining it, but she's almost as clueless as Clint. Clint gave up, for now, figuring out what those signs meant, so he just took an arrow and loaded it onto the bow. That's when he first saw and felt the difference from his old bow. It's more steady and a lot easier to draw the string. Pushing aside the thought for now and aimed about towards a dandelion flower hundred meters away. He took a deep breath, slowly released it, and fired the arrow. The result was staggering. The arrow flew away in subsonic speeds, and that's with half a draw. With the arrow impacted the ground, it exploded into a cloud of dust. As soon as the dust settled, everyone saw a small crater with a broken bolt in the center. Holy shit. Clint and Natasha involuntarily let out, which is an entirely normal reaction, but they forgot one small detail that caused them to take on a deer caught in the headlights look. Daddy? What shit? Lila asked. Natasha's safe house New York. February 1st, 2007, 3 o'clock. Natasha had a long and tiring two days. After testing Clint's bow, a still exhausted Laura rushed down the stairs carrying a crying Cooper. The explosion was apparently loud enough to wake up Laura and the baby. Add to the fact that Lila was continuously asking what shit, and you got the recipe for an angry mother. Fearing for her safety, Natasha took a page from Naruto's playbook and made a hasty retreat. She quickly packed her bags and said goodbye. While boarding the Quinjet, she can see the pleading look on Clint's face for her to stay behind, but her instincts are telling her to go, and that never steered her wrong yet. If that's bad, the next one's worse. Natasha foolishly decided to go to work the next day. She went straight to her office to get some peace, but the universe must have decided to pile it all on her that day. Flashback start. Come in. Natasha shouted after she heard a knock on the door. The door opened slightly and Coulson peeks through the gap. Fury wants a report. Coulson announced. Alright. Natasha replied with a sigh. She stood up and walked out of the room, making sure she locked it behind her. Coulson started walking towards Fury's office while Natasha walked beside him. Anything interesting happened when I'm out? She inquired. Not really. Just some agent who decided to take out an arms dealer without orders. Coulson responded with a shrug. Damn. Saw that, didn't you? Coulson just gave her a blank stare. Of course you saw that. I'm just going to report with you there, so I don't have to repeat everything. Coulson went straight inside Fury's office after doing a biometric scan. Natasha followed behind him, and she saw Fury reading and leaving notes in a folder while sitting on his desk. When she and Coulson sat down on the guest chairs, Fury laid down the reports and closed the folder. That's when she saw the title of the report, although it didn't clue her in on anything. The title on the folder, Avengers Initiative. Nice to see you Romanov. How was your date? Fury asked in a friendly tone, which just made Natasha all the more nervous. Nothing out of the ordinary boss. Natasha answered in a straightforward tone. Though, so taking out Claw is a normal thing. Fury retorted with a raised eyebrow. Let me correct myself, nothing out of the ordinary for Naruto. She answered back. Delight me by answering some of my questions. What happened to the emergency band? The thing short-circuited after the jump, but I think Naruto knew about it because he's the one who told me to contact you. I guess he's also the one who caused your phone signal to jump all over Rome. My signal's jumping. Natasha asked, genuinely confused. Well, that answers that. Fury blurted out. So, where did you go? Natasha internally panicked. She can't really say where they went since it might expose Leon to shield. I don't know. Naruto teleported us in an alleyway behind the restaurant. All I know is that it's a kind of family restaurant with private booths, and it's far away from the center since it's quiet. She lied through her teeth. Fury studied her for a moment, trying to find any indication of her lying but gave up quickly since she's one of the best liars there are. What happened after? Fury proceeded. We exited out back the Naruto teleported us again to some tree line. I only knew where we were in Durban because I squeezed out of Naruto. Natasha reported. I can't say anything else, boss. She weakly added. We're the only ones here and the room is in a communication blackout mode. 
You can say anything here and it won't come out. Fury claimed. I can't say, boss. Natasha pushed back. I order you to report the events in Durban. Fury said with authority. I'm invoking Article 8, Subsection 14 of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agent Handbook. Natasha's retort took Fury and Coulson back. Article 8 talks about circumstances where an agent can disobey a direct order. Subsection 14 is about when an order would cause certain immediate death to the agent. What can you tell me that happened after you arrived in Durban? Fury tried to find a workaround. Naruto doesn't only deal with military and law enforcement. He also has some private customers. Like pie jobs, I guess. Natasha helpfully added. She needs to give them something to get them off her back even a little bit. Oh, and if you haven't heard it yet. Laura just gave birth. Naruto and I help her. She added. Damn. Mazel tov to him. I'll add a three-month undercover mission on his file. Fury Muse. Clint is one of his best agents, and giving him some concessions would go a long way. I expect you to provide me with an unofficial written report of what you can say. He ordered, thinking about how a written report might reveal something new. Fury took a piece of paper from inside the folder and handed it over to her. Moving on. I want you to read this for me. Natasha scanned the paper. As she read through the paper, she realized what Fury wanted to do, and she doesn't know how to feel about it. You want to assemble a team of enhanced that can fight against Naruto? Natasha asked weakly. Not him, someone like him. Someone not on our side. Fury answered. We don't know who or what else is out there. Naruto may not only be the only one out there with his power level. Hell, chances are, there's someone stronger than that guy. I want to be prepared for any eventuality. I want to have a symbol that humanity can really behind when dark times are upon us. He finished, but everyone heard the underlying message. If Naruto turns, they'll take him down. This is not a long list, boss and let's be honest, Barton and I are barely enhanced, and the other guy is a loose cannon. Natasha reasoned. I know. That's why I want to know if Naruto is a viable option on this team. How wise, more than qualified. But on the personality side, there's a problem. Naruto might look like he loves the spotlight, but he thrives in the dark. The same problem with Barton and me. You won't get your symbol with us. The side Naruto is even more predictable than the big guy. Do you have any idea how to make him join the Avengers initiative? You need to make him want to join. Any other option would either reject the offer or make him an enemy, and we both know the last one is the worst outcome. Fury thought hard about Natasha's statement. Everything Romanov said was true, but with Naruto's appearance, it opens a whole new ballpark of things S.H.I.E.L.D. needs to deal with. That's all, Romanov. I'll be expecting your written report by the end of the day. Fury said, dismissing her. Flashback end. The following day isn't much better. She was in her office again when Naruto decided to do a surprise visit before going to Wakanda. It would have been a key thing to do with other girls, but Natasha is a world-class spy. As soon as Naruto played guess who she drew her gun and shot Naruto multiple times in the gut. The sound must have resonated outside since the alarms for an attack started blaring. Good thing Naruto is immortal and can take multiple hits from a 9mm, or she would have been cleaning buckets of blood from her office. Naruto gave her a quick hiss before he started writing something down on a piece of paper and left it on the table. He then grabbed her hand, and the next thing she knew, she was in Wakanda again. Everything went a little bit more subdued than the first visit. She can feel the underlying tension in the air, especially from the border tribe members. As expected, she and Naruto were interviewed while sitting on the lie detector chairs. Nothing new came except she now knew that Naruto kept leaving packages for the king just to mess with him. She could see King Chaka between pissed and entertained. The underlying tension in the room only lifted after Naruto gave everyone a taste of his cooking, even her, and she has to admit it's the best thing she ever tasted. When Naruto revealed the name of his restaurant, that's when she realized that the hottest new fast food, Shakugakure, is owned by Naruto. As expected, the tribal council quickly approved the opening of the restaurant, checking one of Naruto's requests. The royal family would even help in its construction. The next request was also approved. Apparently, everyone wanted to see if Naruto can damage or destroy a piece of pure vibranium. Flashback start. The tribal council, royal family, Dora Mulahe, guards, Wakandan scientists, and Natasha are on a troop transport 10 meters of the ground. 50 meters in front of them is Naruto without his Kamoyo beads, playing around with a ball of pure vibranium with a diameter of a foot. They can clearly see him through a holographic projection screen attached to the transport. Your Majesty, with all due respect, no one can destroy pure vibranium. It can only be changed from one form to another. It's the perfect representation of the law of conservation of mass. A scientist told King Chaka. You know that, I know that, we all know that. But there's nothing lost in this experiment. Either he destroys the ball and we learn something new, or he doesn't, and we just took a pleasant stroll outside the city. The king answered. Naruto kept tossing the ball around until he placed it on the ground. He removed his jacket and shirt and put it somewhere behind him, which then disappeared, leaving him in his black slacks and boots. 
I still can't figure out how he does that. The largest thing I saw him do that was his motorcycle. Chala said a little loudly, probably to answer everyone's question. He's the one holding on to Naruto's Kamoyo beads. Natasha studied Naruto's body. She saw black marks running everywhere on his abdomen and forearms. The characters are similar to the ones visible on the knife, so the tattoo might not just be decorative. Naruto picked the ball again held it close to his chest. With his free hand, he did a single hand sign and said something. Black flames erupted around his body, covering everything. The fire was so hot that they could feel it burning their skin even from 50 meters away. They were forced to move back to the troop carrier until they were half a kilometer away. From that distance, they can see the grasses turning into ash, the rocks and soil melting, and the air forming small flashes of lightning, probably due to the formation of plasma by the superheated air. The only one they can see not affected by it was Naruto. Precisely 20 seconds after the flames appeared, it died down. They can finally see the aftermath of what happened. Naruto was standing on top of a lake of lava 20 meters wide, and his right hand was a pile of dust. He did another hand sign with his free hand and this time, cold air blasted everywhere. The lava he was standing on immediately solidified. The wildfire he started also died down. Great, Bass. How can anyone survive that? Chaka exclaimed in awe. What did he say before the fire erupted? Chala asked. I think he said a Amaterasu. Okoye answered. The Japanese goddess of the sun. Natasha added weakly. A fitting name. Chaka replied. Your Highness, the fire burned as hot as the surface of the sun. A Wakandan scientist voiced out. And it doesn't appear to be its hottest since the temperature keeps on climbing. As the scientist was speaking, Naruto, now wearing a shirt, was jogging over to the transport. He leaped onto the carrier when he was a few meters out. He walked over to stunned scientists, grabbed his hand and opened his palm. Look into this for me, will you? Naruto said while dumping a handful of black dust to the man's hand. He walked over to her side and finally noticed all the stares on him. What? Is there any dirt on my face? Flashback end. Natasha could have punched him silly right there and then, but his obliviousness just makes him all the more endearing. She hates that she started to fall quickly, but there's nothing she could do against it. Naruto's experiment spurred the Wakandans into a fervor. They consider vibranium as a sacred metal and with good reason. It's used in almost every part of their lifestyle and the reason why they have advanced so much. The royal family held a small gathering as a celebration for the new friends of Wakanda. Well, it's more like they're trying to bribe Naruto to do more tests and jobs for them. She just happens to be with him. Naruto went batshit crazy during the party. He managed to outdrink in the party, even Chala, who she now knows has a more similar skill set to Captain America. They decided to leave when the party was dying down. But before they could go, Chala pulled them aside. Flashback start. I have a job for you. Chala said to them when they were sufficiently out of the way. Let me hear the details first before I give my price. Naruto replied. I want you to find my uncle Njogu's son. Naruto thought about it for a second and pulled out a folder from behind him. Are you going to contact him? Naruto asked seriously while lifting the folder. Yes. I intend to bring him home. Chala asserted. Damn. I can't give this to you in good conscience. Why? Chala asked with a slight snarl. How can I put this lightly? Hmm. Naruto mused. Oh, I know. He'll destroy Wakanda. What? His whole life, he prepared for one single purpose. Be the king of Wakanda and basically take over the world. Of course, it's for fighting racism against dark-skinned races, but Wakanda would inevitably fall if he becomes king. So, what do you want me to do? Just forget about him. Nah. I make contact with him. We just need to keep anything Wakandan as far away from him as possible until we change his worldview. Chala thought about it, and Naruto's plan made the most sense. It would eventually bring back a member of the royal family, while keeping Wakanda safe. Alright. Thank you. Chala said with a bow. Hold up. I haven't set my price yet. Naruto interjected. Right. Forgot about that. So what's the price? Chal sheepishly replied. A copy of how a vibranium suit could be made. You want to know how to make a suit. Not a suit itself. I was going to ask you to make Natasha a suit, but I have another material in mind. I just want to know how you make one, so I have an idea. Naruto explained. Natasha, who was listening in on the conversation, perked up. Having a suit made of vibranium would be awesome, but the mystery material Naruto said indeed piqued her curiosity. I can do that, but I want monthly updates about it. I'll call you over the Kamoyo beads in a month so you could pick it up. Chala replied after a moment of thinking. Flashback end. Natasha can't believe what happened in the past two days, but the most shocking thing that happened was after Natasha brought him to her safe house. One thing led to another, and now she's lying on the bed with Naruto beside her. Both of them naked. What are you thinking? She heard Naruto asked. Guess how crazy everything the last two days have been. She responded. Naruto gave out a small chuckle. So, what happened to the second and third date? Naruto continued. I thought this was the second date. 
she replied. Naruto pulled her closer to him and hugged her. This is not the second date. This is more like a business trip or something. You still have to plan for our second date. Naruto answered while kissing the top of her head. Yeah. You still going to teach me how to build a bike. She said while looking straight to his eyes. She then turned around and mounted him. But in the meantime, I have more enjoyable activity in mind. She finished before kissing him deeply. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want the next part of this video, like subscribe and comment down below, and turn on the bell notification. And also check out other videos that I have created and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.